Hello again and welcome. This will be part 7 of my review for the Goss and Metro Watt. This is the Metro Hit Ultra. It's a model M248B. This one has the built-in Bluetooth. See out to the right we have our transient generator and above it we have our half cycle line simulator. We'll be using this today to evaluate the robustness of the front end of this meter. In the previous video I showed where I made this shield out of mu metal. And this really helped this meter as far as holding a static charge cloth next to it or just placing my hand next to it. It also helped with our relay sensitivity to the magnetic strap which can cause the meter to change states where the meter will actually read a lower AC voltage on the input than what could actually be present. I think before we do this there's one last test that I'd like to show you with the meter. This is looking at the manual for the meter and I had pointed this out very early on when I first started looking at the different Gaussian meters and there was a note in here when you're measuring the frequency and duty cycle that the applied signal voltage may not exceed 5 volts. And you can see down here, they show a 5 volt maximum. So I guess the idea is that you're supposed to use this to look at digital signals. And of course when I'm functionally testing this, I am looking at a CMOS type output and it actually drives rail to rail, that's why you see it going all the way up to 5 volts. But you can see it has a maximum frequency of 1 megahertz and we had measured that and it does go just slightly above this and again I believe that's limited by the firmware in the meter I don't believe that that's actually a hardware limit but that greatly limits what you're going to actually be able to use this meter for but my concern with it is really what's the threshold levels of this because I can tell you when I first looked at the meter it looked like it was very sensitive to what those levels were you can see this is the technical data and this is on page 59 of the manual and you can see if you look across this there is no mention really of what the voltage thresholds are for this. So what I'd like to do is take all three of these meters, put them in series and then connect them up to our scope and we'll run this back to our function generator and then we'll just vary the input level and the offset and let's just see how sensitive this meter is compared to these other two. So let me go ahead and get that set up. So currently the oscilloscope is set for 500 millivolts per division you can see we're outputting roughly one division or 500 millivolts and you can see it's centered around the ground point and while the SEM meter isn't having any trouble with this you can see the Ryman BM869S as well as the Metrohit Ultra are both unable to read this signal. What I'm going to do is start increasing the amplitude and we'll just keep it centered around the ground point and let's see where these two meters start working at. So you can see now that the BM869 is picking up the signal so currently I'm outputting a 2.390 volts peak to peak signal and of course the sum worked all the way down to 500 millivolts but you can see the ultra is still not able to read this what I'll do is just go ahead and increase that a little bit further so you can see I have our scope set for 2 volts per division right now and my current amplitude is 2.5 volts peak to peak and rather than displaying 5 kilohertz like the sum and the Bryman our metro hit is showing 600 kilohertz. Let me try increasing the amplitude a little bit further and see if it picks this up. Oh, right there. So that's currently at 3.80 volts peak to peak. Okay, so our scope is currently set for 500 millivolts per division. And now you can see our peak to peak voltage is 1.9. And you can see the ultra is not having any trouble with this. So what I'd like to do now is try decreasing this voltage and let's see where these meters start to fall off at. So I was at 1.9 volts peak to peak with a 0.95 volt offset and the metro hit wasn't having any trouble with that. So currently I'm still running the same 0.95 volt offset but I've decreased the peak to peak to 1.6 volts. You can see this meter is now reading 9.5 kilohertz. It's not even close. You can see the waveform here on the scope, again with the offset sitting at 950 millivolts and our signal is only driving down to 800 millivolts so basically it's riding 150 millivolts up off of the ground right now and I'm wondering if that's what the Gossens having trouble with. So what I'm going to do is back the offset down let's just see if this thing will start reading the correct frequency again. You can see it's not even close. I've actually brought the signal slightly below ground and the meter still isn't able to read this. So yeah, you may feel that the meter is actually good for looking at digital signals, but you can just see how insensitive the Bryman and the SEM meter are to the amplitude and the offset compared to this Metro hit. 
Let's for fun, what I'll do is I'll increase this offset and let's see where the SEM and the Brahmin actually have a problem with it. So I've changed the amplitude of the scope to 1 volt per division. So this is all the way up to a 1.8 volt offset with a 1.6 volt peak to peak waveform on top of that. And this is right at the edge where the Brahmin's going to have a problem with this. It's interesting, you can see the Metra hit is trying to read 47 kilohertz off of this. The Gaussian is actually in the center, so what I've done is, you can see the scope basically routing to the SEM meter, the SEM goes off to the Metra hit, the Metra hit off to our Brymon and then back to our function generator. So currently I have our scope set for 1 volt per division. I'm outputting a 2 volt peak to peak with a 1 volt offset and this meter should have no trouble with this at all. You can see we are reading the 5 kilohertz on the SEM as well as our Bryman BM869S. So how come this meter isn't able to read this right now? It's because I took the magnetic hanger off of our little cheapy meter and I waved that behind this meter and again I don't have the shield installed in this thing right now. This meter is basically back to its original factory condition right now. So the problem where I showed you that the relay could be in the wrong state and you could be in the AC volts mode and the meter could be reading 4 volts or less with 120 volt signal or more applied that also holds true for the frequency input. The relay could be in the AC state you could be trying to read frequency with this and of course it's going to read zero. So again the one way to change that state of the relay switch this over you can hear the relay switch go back to frequency and there's our 5 kilohertz. Alright so off to the right we have our transient generator and again this is connected up to our meter and we have our high voltage probe out that we'll use to monitor the transients and currently the oscilloscope is set for 500 volts per division so you can see it's a 1000 volt peak transient so what we're going to be doing is applying five transients in each mode of the meter and then I'll go back and I'll flip the leads to get both positive and negative and then we'll functional test the meter. So again, the meter right now is currently 100% functional. Uh, assuming that it passes, I'll just keep incrementing the transient level up to the point where either the meter fails or I have to pull out the other transient generator. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, this will be five transients. This is a two ohm source, 1000 volts peak with a 100 microsecond full width half height. And again, there is a major difference between the IEC standards and what I'm doing here. I'm not trying to surge test these meters for safety. The goal of these tests have always been just to look at the robustness of the meter's front ends. And so this transient generator is capable of putting out a maximum of about 20 joules on the high side. And again, the only difference with this transient generator is I'm applying a 100 microsecond full width half height, where the IEC standard will call out a 50 microsecond full width half height. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Again, the other thing with the IEC standard is they'll call out that waveform be superimposed on top of the AC line. Here you can see I don't have any kind of a supply voltage. And again, I don't test the current inputs of the meter. All right, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter. I'll just start with the AC volts. Again, this should be roughly 2.5. That's correct. You can see it's at 60 hertz. That's correct. And we'll add our bias to it. it should be roughly 3.6. That's correct. It should be roughly 5 volts. That's correct. And this should be 5 volts. Let's just try the temperature input. It should be roughly 500 degrees. It's our continuity test. It seems fine. Resistance mode, again, I won't zero this out. This is with 1 ohms, 50 ohms, 100 ohms, 1K, 10K, 100K, 1 meg, 10 meg. This will be a 150 picofarads, 1 nanofarad. 0.1 microfarad, 1 microfarads, 10 microfarads, 
100 microfarads. This is the diode check, and here's a short one diode, two diodes, and three diodes in series. This all looks fine. So it looks like the meter was not damaged. Looking at the spreadsheet containing all the data from the meters that I've tested so far, you can see quite a few meters had failed by this point. Looking at the transient that we just ran, which is a thousand volt with a two ohm source and a hundred microsecond full width half height, that damaged the BK2705B, the circuit test DMR6550, the Southwire 12070T, the ANOVA 3320, and last it looks like the Woods DMM W3. So the next test will program the generator for 1.5 kV. Okay, we can see the scope is still set for 500 volts per division, and you can see we're three divisions up, or one and a half thousand volts. And again, we'll just repeat this test using five transients in all modes of the meter. Okay, so it looks like the meter pass is functional just fine. So the scope is currently set for still 500 volts per division, but you can see I've moved the offset down to the bottom of the screen, and you can see we're four divisions up, or 2 kV. Okay, again, five transients, positive, negative. Every mode of the meter will be tested. 2,000 volts, two ohm source impedance. So at the 1.5 thousand volt level, the Amprobe AM530 had failed that test, along with the Tech Power TP40, the Fluke 87V, the Victor VC921, and the SEMDT9939, and the Maztec MS8211D. Those all failed at 1.5 kV. Again, this spreadsheet is available for free online. Just follow the link that I provided. You can download a copy, view the data yourself. And again, as always, no company is paying me to run these tests. This is all paid for out of my own pocket, just out of my own interest. I don't work for any companies that sell meters or manufacture them. I just make the data available for the few of you that may be interested in viewing it. Okay, that's it. We'll go ahead and functional test it. But before I do that, I want to show you another problem that I've noticed with this meter off and on. Hopefully here it's going to replicate this time. And it has to do with this frequency input. So I'm just attaching this to our small test box again. And currently this is set for 60 hertz. And this will have a 2.5 volt output. And now this is switching between the 5 volts and ground. And you can see that here, it's 2.5 volts at the center point. See, I rotate it back, it still reads zero. So I noticed this when I first purchased this meter that basically it couldn't read frequency. And what I've had to do with this from time to time is you basically bring it into the AC volt mode. And you can see now it's reading 59.988 hertz and then I rotate it back to the frequency input and see now it works and it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the relay like you can go between the DC volt and back to the megahertz input and it does not seem to clear it out for whatever reason you have to bring it into the AC volt mode where it's displaying the hertz and then bring it back and it starts working and you can see now I can change it without the bias with the bias, we can cut the frequency in half. We can divide it in half again. This would be 120 hertz. And this will be uh, 240 hertz. 
you can see it has no trouble with that so yeah I don't know what makes it get into this mode uh, I've just I've noticed it from time to time it's definitely something that's probably reproducible it's probably something in their firmware I haven't taken the time to identify it like I say I always just rotate it to the AC volt mode wait for it to read the frequency and then go back it's kind of a headache but I've kind of come to expect that with this meter that it just has a lot of little quirks like this all right let me go ahead and functional test the meter and we'll see if we've done any other damage to it okay the meter pass is functional just fine you can see I've changed the generator settings to two and a half thousand volts again this is 500 volts per division going up so we'll just go ahead and get started again this will be 2.5 kV 2 ohm source so at 2000 volts the Klein Tools MM2000 had failed but that's the only meter Okay, that's it for our 2.5 kV. Let's just for fun go back to our frequency input. Of course, I haven't functional tested this at all yet. And I'll connect them up to the box. And again, we'll just change it to the 60 hertz setting. And again, you can see it's reading zero. And normally it can read this. So again, this is with our bias. What I'll do is I'll go to ohms, I'll just keep this enabled, then we'll go back to megahertz, you can see it's still zero. Let's turn the meter off, and we'll turn it back on, you can see it reads zero. We'll go to volts, you can just hear the relay click, go back to megahertz, you can see it's still reading zero. Let's try it in AC plus DC and you can see it's now reading 60 Hertz and now let's go back to Hertz oh and see now it's working again and that's strange and there's our 30 Hertz again there's our 120 whatever it is again I'm assuming it's some kind of a firmware bug with the meter I don't really know gosh I'd have to weigh in on this just be aware of it if you're actually buying the meter and plan to use this function that it is a little quirky all right let's go ahead and I'll functional test the rest of the meter and we'll see if it still works all right so the meter checks out just fine I've gone ahead and reprogrammed our generator you can see now we're at six divisions or 3,000 volts peak all right so looking at our spreadsheet at two and a half thousand volts that we had just ran it looks like the Greenlee DM20 had failed that, along with the SEM DT9939 that I paid $120 for. So this meter is actually doing quite well so far. You can see there isn't a whole lot of meters that are left that have survived at this kind of level. The meter pass is functional just fine. I've reprogrammed our generator for 4,000 volts. This is the point where we stop incrementing by 500 volts and we move it to 1,000 volts increments. You can see I've changed the scope to 1,000 volts per division. You can see we're four divisions up. Again, we'll be applying five transients, positive and negative, in every mode of the meter. 
Looking at the meters that failed at 3000 volts peak, we have the Kasuntest ZT102. It's also known as the AN8002. One of the comments that I'll see from time to time, people will talk about how fast I cycle this thing and they're concerned that the mobs are heating up and I'm not allowing them time to cool. I have yet to see a mob fail in one of these meters like this one. I think we said it's rated for somewhere around 70 joules and again I'm typically damaging the meters at less than 10 joules being applied. Let me just move the camera down here for you. So again this is looking at the display off the transient generator. And you can see that we have been running for a total of 1 hour, 46 minutes, and 40 seconds so far. Just to give you some idea how long these tests actually take to run. Again, it's a fairly low stress test. I'm not trying to, again, look at the safety side of the meters. Typically, the IEC combo generators that you would use to do surge testing are much, much larger than this and you're going to have much bigger cables coming out of those and this is where you'll see these online videos from fluke and whatnot where the meters will actually explode you know that's not been the goal of my testing since the beginning i've only really been interested in how robust the meters designs are occasionally people ask about doing mechanical testing with these as well one of the more common tests that people have asked for is some kind of a drop test. You know, that's not something I'm really interested in doing. Normally these meters, they never get dropped. Uh, they would just sit around on my desk for these high-end ones. Of course, the ones I take outside that I actually use in the garage and stuff, they're not this kind of a high-end meter. But those get, you know, sprayed with all sorts of bad chemicals like brake cleaner and such. I use methanol and I'll use gasoline. Uh, so you'll actually see them etch the display on some of those meters. Those do get dropped and they get temperature cycled because they're sitting outside in the garage. Another thing with my meters I use out in the garage is they would never be exposed to anything high voltage like this. Of course I do work with ignitions but you know I'm not going to be the type that would try to look at the output of a mag or the output of my high voltage coils. You know with the meter directly so chances of the meter being damaged like that it's basically not going to happen i don't do any kind of you know line voltage measurements with them and then for those meters i typically won't spend over 50 dollars for those because i know they're going to normally have a fairly short life in that environment the current meter that i use for that is made by maztec uh, actually the one before that was a maztec as well it actually failed because of a mechanical problem with the flip display on it. Of course up here in my hobby lab I actually do play with some high voltages with a modest amount of energy and you know of course I've got a carpeted floor and such so static becomes more of a concern. It's really part of my interest in running these tests. One of the first digital meters I ever purchased was a fluke and I ended up damaging that meter twice just using it with basically fairly low voltages sub kV and I had repaired that thing both times I didn't actually send it back to fluke and they sell you the ICs and such for it and I think those ICs at the time were like seventy or so dollars a piece so it was a fairly expensive meter to maintain and after a while I just gave up and I bought a uh, HP meter that I still have it's never had any problems at all the next meter I bought was another HP and I still own both of those meters I still use them they work great nice thing about these higher end handheld meters is they can actually do some of the functions that I normally would use a bench meter for but you know to be honest I probably would not recommend a hobbyist go out and buy a high-end handheld meter like this for 
you know, bench work. They're nice because they're kind of portable. You can move them around the bench real easily, but you can get some fairly high-end bench meters for a fairly low cost now, used, send them out, have them uh, recalibrated and checked over for you, and they would probably make a very good meter. I don't get too concerned about the safety of this transient generator as well. You can see I have this really thick plexiglass lens that I can use to cover up the meters or other devices when I'm testing. There's a magnetic strip here that holds that shut. Normally when I'm just running with this transient generator though the energy levels are so low I've never seen a meter actually come apart. Of course when we use this generator in conjunction with this uh, there actually can be some fairly substantial damage to the meter. All right, that's it. We have now ran for almost two hours straight. I think the batteries in the camera are probably going to conk out fairly quick. So what I'm going to do is uh, functional test this. I'll change out the batteries in the camera. And then we can start out fresh at 5,000 volts, I think. Yeah, 5,000 volts next. Okay, the meter passed functional testing just fine. So I've changed our generator to put out 5 kV. Again, this is a thousand volts per division. You can see we're up five divisions. So again, we'll be applying five transients, positive and negative, to the meter. This is still with a two ohm source impedance. Looks like only one meter had failed at 4 kV, and that was the Unity UT10A. I think that was a little pocket meter. I think the reason it was surviving is they had like some traces that were too close together and it would break down between the two traces. Actually looking at my data it looks like the Cassentest KT6000 which is also branded under an AN860B also failed that test. All right, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test it. All right, so it looks like the MetroHit Ultra survives that transient just fine. So I thought what I'd do is bring out the meters that have actually survived that transient. On the far left, I have the Fluke 101, and then the Fluke 107, the Bryman BM869S, the EEV blog rebranded Bryman BM235, the Fluke 17B Plus, the Ampro BAM 510, the Hioki DT4252, and the Fluke 115. There were a couple other meters that also survived to this level, and that was the Radio Shack 220087. There was also a Unity 15C Plus. It really wasn't like a meter like these, it was a high voltage probe. At the 5kV level, I had damaged a Hold Peak HP 760H along with the Unity UT139C and also the Keysight U1231A. So both the Ampro BAM 510 and this Fluke 101 were used in my very first shootout that I ever did. And of course the Fluke 101 ended up winning that. This AM510 actually would fail at the next level that I tested at. You can see it's been damaged. It's marked on the bottom where I replaced Q7. I had to go through and realign it. These are the adjustment settings. But I had taken this meter and actually ran it on this exact same generator and ran the same 5,000 volt, 100 microsecond full width half height after those repairs. And this meter still survives that. Of the meters that you're looking at, the only ones that have not been damaged are the Fluke 101 the Bryman BM-235, and on the far right, the Fluke 115. The Hioki didn't actually get damaged electrically. The board's got some slits in it, and then the case actually protrudes up through those slits. And what had happened was the case isn't made to actually cover the entire area of the slit, and it started to arc around that plastic of the case, and it broke down the plastic. What I ended up doing was putting in a little plastic extension and I actually tested this meter up at much higher voltages and it didn't break down anymore. 
Of course, all these meters are fully functional right now, and I continue to use them for comparisons against other meters. Okay, so I've got our generator turned all the way up. This thing will put out between 5.8 and 5.9 kV. The batteries are starting to go dead in the camera. Clock on the transient generator is showing 4 hours, 14 minutes, 26 seconds. This basically takes a full day to run tests on these. And that's it. So 4 hours and 19 minutes. That's a lot of run time. Alright, so the Metro hit survived the 5.8 kV test just fine. So what I've done now is I brought out our original transient generator. You can see that sitting here. What we're going to do is start out with roughly a 6,000 volt transient. This will be a 50 microsecond full width half height instead of the 100 microsecond, but it'll still be a 2 ohm source impedance. And you can see the transient here on the scope. This is still 1,000 volts per division or 6 divisions up. And again, we'll be applying both positive and negative transients. And then we'll be doing a functional test at the end of each one. Let's show you what that transient looks like. I just zoomed in a little bit. It's just shy of 6 kV. This shouldn't cause this meter to fail. Just be a little bit more careful with this transient generator. It doesn't have the programmability like the new one, so you actually have to strap this thing for each different configuration, and so you have to go inside of it to do that. So I just have a little shorting strap here. It's got a resistor in series with it. And I use this to discharge the bank. It doesn't actually shut down when it's finished with the transients. It would just run indefinitely, where this one will actually turn off the output. That's it. Okay, so the Ultra Pass functional just fine. I've gone ahead and restrapped our generator for 8 kV. See it over on the scope here. We're still 1,000 volts per division. You can see we're actually at about 7.5. And, and again, we'll be applying 5 transients, both negative and positive. Okay, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter. Looks like the Metro Hit survives that just fine. Scope is now set for 5 kV per division, so you can see we're up two divisions here, or roughly 10,000 volts peak. There's actually not very many meters that I've tested at this level. One of them was the modified UT61E. I also tested my modified UT181A. Uh, the Hioki DT4252 was tested and actually passed this level. The Fluke 115 was tested at this level and passed. The Fluke 101 had passed this level. The Fluke 17B Plus passed this level. Unfortunately, my Brahman BM869S and the Radio Shack, when I was testing those, I didn't actually have a way to strap this generator up. I was essentially rebuilding it every time I would change the uh, settings. So I don't exactly know where that BM869 fails at. Okay, we got fresh batteries in the camera. Flashcard's been erased. I think we're ready to go. There's our first transient. We'll go ahead and functional test this. I thought just for fun, let's just connect this up to a couple of alligator clips. 
This is 5K Wise UT61E that I've used for so many different tests. Let's see if this thing will arc over. I think we just lost a trace. <laughs> so this is what we were just subjecting this thing to. This board just never gets old, does it? So we'll just start again. This will be capacitance. So that'll be 150 picofarads, dead on. This is one nanofarad, 0.1 microfarads, one microfarad, 10 microfarads, 100 microfarads. This will be roughly 500 degrees. So it'll be a little over a thousand. And this will be basically room temp. It's a continuity test. This is with a 0.5 ohm. 1 ohms, 50 ohms, 100 ohms, 1000 ohms, 10K, 100K, 1 meg, 10 meg, this would be 60 hertz, there's 30, 15, 120, 240, this will be roughly 5 volts. Should be 5 volts roughly. This would be 2.5. And this should be roughly 3.6. And this should be 2.5. And 2.5, and and you can see 60 hertz. So that was a pretty impressive hit this thing just survived. You start pushing 10,000 volts, 50 microsecond full with half height. But we can go higher and see our scope set at 5 kV per division. Uh, this is currently 10 microseconds per division. So you can see our full width half height somewhere out in here, about five divisions out. Uh, this is 12,000 volts that we're going to be applying. But I think before we do that, I have another meter that I have not tested up that high. The 121GW. Yes. No. How about this one? This guy here was only ever run to 10,000 volts as well. So my plan is we're going to run this thing at 12. And then we're going to run this guy at 12. Okay, and I think we are set to go. So again... This will be roughly 12,000 volts, five transients, positive and negative, each mode of the meter. And there's your first transient. What I'll do is while I'm functional testing that meter, I'll just start running the Ultra. So it looks like the EEB blog rebranded BM235 is held up just fine to that transient. Alright, that's it. I'll go ahead and functional test the meter. So the one thing that all four of these meters have in common is that they all four pass that test just fine. The Fluke 101 was actually tested all the way up to 13,000 volts with 100 microsecond full width half height and the 2 ohm source impedance. The next model up from this, the Fluke 107, I ran all the way up to 14,000 volts with 100 microsecond full width half height and that meter actually survived that. 
I then took the transient all the way up to 15,000 volts and that meter was damaged. And that's the highest level of transients that I've ran to date. Some of the meters like my BM869S by Bryman, I also ran at 13,000 volts, 100 microsecond full with half height and that meter was damaged. Of course at that time I had no way to stop the transient so I don't really know where that meter would fail. It could actually have survived this test that these have all just survived. So to be clear, none of these meters have been damaged so far. I guess as a recap, there's quite a few things I don't like about the meter. One of the things I don't like about the meter is that the comm jack is to the right of the voltage input, just opposite of what the industry standard is. Another thing I don't like about the meter again is the auto range on this. So from a infinite to a dead short, It's just very slow on the auto range. The only thing I don't like about the meter is when you select the AC plus DC mode, you'll get the AC plus DC value here, and in the upper left you get the frequency, but there's no way for you to get the AC or DC components separate. The only way that you can get that is to manually change the dial to select the AC and the DC components. You know, they have a tri display, they should use it. Of course one of the reasons I purchased this particular meter is it has Bluetooth built into it. Unfortunately what I found out is when you use the Bluetooth the current draw of this meter just goes through the roof. So what I found after I wrote some LabVIEW software to communicate with the meter is the meter wouldn't even stay running for 24 hours with the internal batteries. Again of course they have this external battery input which isn't sealed so any kind of contaminants can get down in there and destroy that jack and they don't supply you with any kind of a rubber plug or anything to seal that up. I did look at the price to purchase this adapter and the software that they offer for it and I think it was like an additional $450. Again, I would expect that all to come with the meter, especially for the price of this. So if you watch part two of where I had this thing inside of the chamber, I was actually running this thing at 10 volts per meter, did a sweep across it, and this meter was quite a bit more sensitive in certain areas compared to the other meters that I ran against it. Again, I was quite surprised with that given that this is supposed to be a higher end meter. This is another thing I don't like about the meter. Again, this is just a charged cloth. And you can see I have the inputs right now strapped. And you can see what an effect that has on the meter. Again, I've never seen anything like that. And of course, this meter, again, even with my hand, I can have it grounded here on the table. And you can just see the proximity of my hand has a pretty big effect on the readings of the meter. Another problem I see with the meter again is you put a magnetic strap on the back of this or this gets hit with some other kind of external magnetic field. It can actually change the state of the internal relay of this. So what can end up happening is the meter could be in the AC volts mode and the meter basically will read something below 4 volts and it'll be regardless of what you put on the front end of this thing so you could be looking at you know 440 volts here and the meter could be displaying some very low voltage that makes you think that that's a safe voltage on the front end of this and indeed it may not be so to me that's again a big miss on their part that they would even allow that and of course another problem I showed with the meter is its uh, frequency input is very sensitive to the threshold levels. Again more so than any other meter that I've looked at. And then it also has another bug where it actually can't read the frequency in this mode. And what you end up having to do is select it to the AC or the AC plus DC mode. Wait for it to display the frequency in the upper left and then change it over to frequency and then it clears out whatever that problem is and then the meter seems to work fine. One of the things that would really concern me about buying a meter like this here stateside is just the lack of communications and support. Gossa now owns Durands and for us we have to actually go through them for any sort of service and I had mentioned early on that I would written them and I would asked about performing an alignment of the meter and it ended up with them blocking my email address and of course I found that very unprofessional not something I was expecting. I ended up writing Gossen in Germany. Again, I got no response. And then it looks like a few other people started to write Gossen. And the first one I saw was this member, Old Neurons, who wrote this. And they were basically saying that they were close to purchasing one of these meters. And then they saw the videos that I had posted 
uh, basically it was asking is this an isolated problem what are the models of your products and the list that are affected by these issues and do you intend to solve any of these issues of course I don't really know how much Gossin reviewed the data that I presented uh, obviously looking through the mail they looked at some of it they start out their response saying that they regret that you postponed your purchase the Metro hit ultra is a robust precision multimeter despite the behavior reported by Smith in the EV blog and so then they go on to say yes Joe Smith wrote a letter to the subsidiary in the USA which I did he targeted to receive a description of the interface protocol in order to calibrate the device by himself which the subsidiary refused to release this leaded to contrary positions and not answering to his letter well I've read the email chain out loud and not once have I ever asked for the description of the interface protocol in order to calibrate the device by myself what I was asking for was companies in the US that may be able to align one of these meters when they would fall out of calibration and of course MetroWatt had actually sent me a similar email to this and they stripped out this whole part so I pointed out to them that this member had actually posted this email and that this piece was in there and I asked them point blank about this like where did they get this information from and they came back and basically said that the subsidiary had told this to them and to be frank I was quite surprised that they would release a statement like this to a potential customer without checking the facts so if we look at the next one I doubt this is an isolated issue affecting only that unit is this an isolated problem so he says it's true we recognize the sensitivity of the Metrohead Ultra to electromagnetic interferences susceptibility to this can be recognized by the strong electric field Joe Smith tested with a 10 volt per meter and a relatively high field strength leading to the observations he made we usually test with a 3 volt per meter which does not affect the MetroHit Ultra please observe that this device is nevertheless compliant to all relative ISO standards so for me personally I can tell you that this statement here is kind of funny because um, I've done a lot of testing at 100 volts per meter I had to go to an outside lab once to run some testing and I don't know our amplifiers or something were down and so I went to this other facility and I told them that I need to run you know 100 volts per meter and gave them the frequency ranges that I needed to run at and the gentleman that ran the lab there he kind of chuckled and he said yeah you know basically they test it a thousand volts per meter at that lab and the whole reason behind that is they were doing testing for government work and I guess one of the tests that they run is for some of these missiles and they have to fly them into essentially like a radar system and they want to make sure that the radar system doesn't knock out the electronics so apparently thousand volts per meter for that testing so yeah to me 10 volts per meter that's basically your industrial standard you know if you take a meter like this out into an industrial environment that's what you would normally expect to see I showed you how this high-end meter compared against the other lower end meters and this meter did quite poorly if they feel that's acceptable it's fine with them but another thing that concerns me with their response is they seem to cherry pick some of the things that I show they fail to talk about the charge cloth they fail to mention that you know I can put my hand next to this thing and the meter wax out to the point where I can't even zero it out you know the 10 volts per meter fine if you want to talk about that it's fine but you know what about the more obvious problems that this meter has you know there's no mention in here about the magnetic strap changing the state of the relay what about that you know that could actually be a safety problem it's like they don't even want to talk about it so we can't reproduce the observed emissions at the 1.2 gig uh, that doesn't surprise me too much uh, they talk about the cake box and maybe it's resonant at that point and that's very possible uh, so I won't dispute that but again that was never really a concern the reason I was pointing that out was I was wondering if that was what was causing this coupling problem where the meter seemed to be sensitive to the proximity of my hand of the meter that was the only reason that that came up so what other models of your products list are affected by these issues it says the other multimeters in our portfolio do not show the same sensitivity as the MetroHead Ultra wow so I went out and just happened to buy the meter that was the worst one out of the portfolio go figure what's the chances of that uh, the problem is solely subject to the MetroHead Ultra 
I mean, it's possible. I'd have to run every meter that they produced, and I certainly am not going to invest the capital to do it. Do you intend to solve these issues? And they say, yes, we've already started activity to improve the EMC of the MetroHit Ultra. So again, Gossin has actually written me directly. They basically sent me the same letter, and like I say, they removed the comment about the emails. Um, I did call them out about that, and I asked them point-blank questions about you know, the charged cloth affecting the meter. What about my hand's proximity to the meter? Why they cherry picked the responses that they did? But I ended up receiving an email from their service department that included the programming manual for this. It's actually a very good document, and I'm surprised that it just isn't available right on their website. You know, I read through the document. I didn't see anything in there that would have been proprietary. You know, certainly nothing that I'm going to use to I guess hack the meter or something. I don't know what their concern with about releasing it would be. I think that's going to be it for this video. I'm sorry it took so long. Again with the meter just having so many problems it kind of slowed things down and it is a fairly complex meter and I did really want to dive into some of the details on how it works. Well, I think that's going to be all so until the next meter. Later.